And we are especially happy. I'm going to just flat out say it, Barry. We are honored to have a true legend of the wrestling business, Stan the Lariat Hansen, the bad man from Borger, Texas, Barry. Stan, welcome. And we're so happy to have you here on Breaking K Fabe with Bowdrin and Barry. Well, uh, it's uh, it's always nice to be able to talk uh, uh, with people that uh, remember wrestling back in the days that I was really wrestling. So uh, it's always nice to speak to people and uh, dredge up some uh, memories of a lot of the great talent I was around and uh, anything. But uh, I, I don't know if I'm a legend, but uh, I, I'm really happy to where I'm at. I got to meet Stan, and I think this is great because I got to meet Stan about six weeks ago when he came into Philadelphia, and, you know, I get to, I get to meet a lot of wrestlers, Jeff, just, you know, the, the same as you do. We get to meet a lot of the boys. Stan was one of the friendliest guys I have ever met, and I put down a program in front of him from 1973 where Stan was wrestling a guy by the name of Two-Ton Tony Nero, and Stan... Stan was having a blast because he's telling me about Tony Nero, but then he's he's giving me a tour of the entire card, and he's going to tell me everybody he was working with. And I got to say, it was just a great experience. So get a chance, mark out at the Meadowlands. Stan is a really friendly guy. I know he would love to meet you. But Stan, your time in Florida in 1973 it looks like it was a couple of months that you got to spend there, uh, and it, you know, this was fairly early in your career. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, actually, I I started uh, I started January first, seventy three, and uh, in Amarillo territory, and uh, back then they traded out some talent. So I think it was around six or seven months uh, after uh, working in Amarillo, they sent me down to Florida, and uh, they worked with Eddie Graham, uh, uh, Dory Senior, and him had a good relationship, evidently. And the Funks, uh, both Terry and Dory, you know, went in and were big, big cards down there and, uh, you know, in the Florida. But anyway, yeah, so I went in there as the underneath guy and, uh, you know, starved, but learned a lot and uh, really enjoyed meeting some, you know, unique talent. Uh, Tony Nero was just one of them, you know. Is there anybody that you specifically remember as as being someone that really helped show you the way and and you know maybe on one of those car trips really gave you some uh, some of the uh, the FYI for your information stuff that you kept with you? Oh well, let me think. You know uh, that there are. I'm trying to bring up a couple of uh, old timers' names that uh, really uh, really did good. Uh, you know that uh, kind of showed me showed me around a little bit but uh you know ron robert fuller was uh you know uh working there uh tony charles from england he was uh he was a junior heavyweight guy that was really off the charts he was a great great talent and could really do stuff and uh my graham and steve kern steve kern and i ended up uh kind of teaming up a little bit before he teamed up with my graham later but uh, Steve and I had a chance to, uh, you know, uh, work as a tag team a, a number of times. And I got to meet Steve's dad, who was a POW for seven years. And uh, what a great honor that was to meet Steve's dad. And uh, anyway, but yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of good talent and, uh, around there. Uh, and I can't... Uh, I was learning every day. Oh, I got to work with Johnny Valentine, you know, yeah. on television. You know, uh, of course, he, he beat beat me up pretty quick and everything. But I, I, I was going to say Johnny's well known for his light touch in the ring, Stan. I'm sure you didn't remember yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> he actually, actually uh, you know, I, he said, now lay him in, and I mean lay him in. I said, uh, well, I was pretty green anyway, and <laughs> so anyway uh he, he, when it came for me to give him a punch i punched him and i mean i hit him just about as hard as i could because he told me to and uh and he took a couple of steps back and said beautiful baby you know <laughs> typical johnny valent i mean a valentine you know so anyway yeah a lot yeah, of good yeah. memories and you had a nice little run, and, and I think after you left Florida, is that when you went out to uh, the McGurk territory and teamed up with Frank Goodish? 
No, I, uh, no, that was later. But uh, what I did was uh, I went to back to Amarillo for a while, and then uh, then I went to uh, Oklahoma and Louisiana and worked for McGurk. And uh, Grizzly Smith was the booker, and uh, Leroy was running. You know, from it was 700 miles from Tulsa, Oklahoma to Homa, Louisiana, and they run on Sunday. And Monday night, so that man, you, we put some miles in in a car, you know, through the, and they weren't freeways back there either. <laughs> but, so yeah, probably exchanging cars about every six months, I'm guessing, huh? Well, I mean, we, you could burn one out, all right. That's true, you know, Brody. That's where I did get hooked up with Frank Goodish, you know. And later changed his name to Brody, or and uh, but he. Uh, uh, he never drove a car. <laughs> he was he was smart. He never took a car to a territory and just hit strides. That was the way he did it and uh, paid people trans and so forth. So, I was going to say, I hope he at least gave you some trans money for that. If he's you're doing all the driving, yeah. <laughs> we did. So, we, you know, we kind we both went to West Texas. See, so we had kind of uh, we had met a few times. He was three years older than me. And was you know only there for about a year that I that I was at West Texas, but uh, you know we had that connection, and so you know in Louisiana it was kind of a natural thing uh, for us to be together. He he had broke in with uh, for Fritz von Erich in Dallas territory, and I broke in with the Funks in Amarillo. So uh, anyway, we were together, and we were big dumb, and uh, we were really crazy. <laughs> well, you know, at this point, let me just mention, Stan, uh, our producer, Lou Kippelman, has reminded us that uh, your book, The Last Outlaw, which, by the way, is a great wrestling book. It's uh, available through crowbarpress.com and our friend uh, uh, Scott over there. Uh, but getting back to uh, on the uh, on the road. So you told me when we had dinner, uh, I reminded Stan before we started recording here that we had had dinner a couple of years ago in Fort Lauderdale. And you had reminded me of the guy that was really one of the sparks of your career, because he was the guy that tipped Bruno off uh, about Stan Hansen working there. It was, I think his name was Mike. Uh, what was his last name again? Yeah. Mike Peduces. That's it. He was, he was from Steubenville, Ohio, was a good friend of, of, uh, of Bruno, but also he worked all around there, you know, in the, in the, the old WWWF territory. He was living in Dallas. And he was basically out of the business at the time, but he still came around the wrestling matches and he was like a fishmonger. He sold fish to different stores, you know? So, but anyway, he saw me and he says, God, man, you need to get up there and work with Bruno. And I said, well, of course I'd love to, you know, go work with Bruno because he was one of the top guy in, in, in the, you know, in the Northeast for sure. If not in a whole country and, uh, so anyway, he went back there and talked to him, and evidently uh, that started the ball rolling. You know, Bruno called me, and then I guess he called Vince, and and Vince called me. So you know, it all started with Mike Peduces, and I I always really respected him and thanked him every time. I didn't get to see him a whole lot after that, but uh, he was he was quite a guy. Yeah, and if, and if I'm correct, too, in, in your WWE Hall of Fame speech, I believe you thanked Mike Peduces. Uh, I, I might have, that. you know, I uh, don't ask me what I said because, you know, I can't, uh, you know, I talk off the top. You know, nowadays they, they give you a uh, some kind of a script to, to, to read almost verbatim. And, you know, I've always been able to talk off the top of my head and I could never follow, you know, some kind of, uh, it's just word for word the way somebody wants. I, I could say it the way I wanted to say it, and and you know what? Most times it was it was probably better, I think. But yeah, anyway. there's a, there's a lot of guys of your generation that I just can't see uh, being handed a script and uh, having you know being told here go ahead and read this Terry Funk yeah. or uh, or a Bruiser Brody. I I don't think that would work too well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess not. We might so not have been smart enough to do that. So you know that's all right. Yeah, I'll so it, it, if you if you hear any kids in the background, that is Stan is uh, has got his grandkids with him. And Stan, I got to ask too: Are you teaching the grandkids the lariat? Are they learning the lariat <laughs> at this stage? 
No, they're girls, and they uh, oh. are. <laughs> There you go. So one of my uh, – and this was a match that I saw live. This would have been 1983. I was uh, visiting someone in Columbus, Ohio, and I happened to see uh, – I think it was at the uh, the Ohio Center, the Columbus Center, and it was uh, NWA, I guess it was World, World Championship Wrestling on tour, and it was you and Ole Anderson in a street fight in the main event. And I, I was just blown away as you two guys were just beating the hell out of each other. And you and Oli had a, had a, a long relationship. You know, your, your run in Georgia, uh, I think, is something that, you know, that was a, a real highlight at the late 70s and then early 80s. But I remember this match and just watching you two. And, and Frank Goodish, Bruiser Brody, was on that, on that card as well. But what were your memories of working with a guy like Oli? He's got a reputation. He, he's uh, known in the circles as being very tough. But obviously, one of the greatest minds in professional wrestling. Yeah, I think so too. You know, he he he, he was the he was the you know a great booker. I thought, and you know, he he had a great great team, and him and Gene, and uh, I guess Lars for a while, Anderson, but Gene Gene Anderson and him were had huge success in the Carolinas, and then Ole was booking in, in Georgia, and uh, you know, he called me in, and uh, anyway. Uh, and I, I thought he was really good. I mean, he had Atlanta on fire for Jim Crockett. I mean, uh, Jim Barnett. And then later he was booking both Charlotte and Atlanta, you know. So, but, uh, yeah, I thought Ole was a great partner, and he was a, a really good opponent, too. And, uh, I mean, I really enjoyed it. And he was a smart guy. I mean, like he said, a lot of people don't like him because he'll te- tell it like he said he thought it, and you know a lot of people can't handle that. But uh, right or wrong, you know that's the way he did it. Well, Stan, let me ask you. You know, as as popular and as well known as you were here in the states, uh, you really were just a megastar uh, over in Japan. So we had talked uh, very briefly before about when you went up and you began your program with Bruno. Now, when you're up in the WWF the first time. Uh, working with Bruno, is that where you first got introduced with the possibility of going to Japan? Was it through Vince McMahon Sr.? Well, no, I'd, uh, I'd, gone, I'd gone to Japan one time. You know, the Funks book for Giant Baba, but Vince, Vince book for uh, Inoki. Uh, Inoki and uh, New Japan. So after I finished up in New York in 76, he he booked me to a couple of tours uh, for uh, New Japan and Anoki, and that's how I got into him. go over there. So when you're Sorry. over in New Japan, no, that's okay. You're, you're working over there, uh, and I remember the story that you told me at dinner was you uh, you realized how tenuous your position was with, in New Japan when one night Abdullah the Butcher came walking into the dressing room, and that's when perhaps – Things be uh, you got interested in things over in all Japan, so uh, could you just tell us of that whole process where you showed up in the final night of the All Japan Tag Tournament, very famous event in Japanese wrestling history, and sort of the mechanizations of what went on with you and and the negotiations with Baba, and I believe you said it was Terry Funk that uh, helped facilitate those negotiations. Am I correct? Yeah, I think uh, pretty much so, I guess. But uh, you know, the thing is, they were pushing. I was really getting a great push, and uh, you know they. They promoted me well, and I, I I was doing real good. And actually, Hulk Hogan was there before he went back uh, to uh, Minnesota and, uh, and became a you know huge star. And, and he was he was there, and they were kind of pushing pushing him a little bit too. And uh, we were sitting there, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, we felt like we were in the in the in the in the right positions and all of a sudden if they bring abdullah from all japan over and it was just a huge a huge deal and i can remember we looked at each other and said wow you know where in the heck do we stand you know so uh anyway but it so then later on uh terry funk who actually broke me into the business contacted me and uh asked me if i might be interested in I said, well, I'm interested in talking, and I mean, I so we I uh, had a meeting with Baba, and uh, you know, we worked out some stuff, and uh, that was 25 years 
I worked for him for 25 years on a handshake. And uh, that's the kind of guy he was. So, you know. Yeah, we, we've but always new- heard. We've always heard, Stan, that, that Baba was probably the fairest promoter that you could deal with in the business. Would that be pretty accurate? Well, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, he is. I got along good with the Noki too, though. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, there, you know, th- that office, I never ever, you know, it was just business. It was a business deal. And, uh, you know, they didn't hold it personal and I didn't hold it personal. And, uh, you know, we're, we, we have a relationship to this day with Anoki and, uh, Mr. Shima and those guys, you know, so, you know, I, but, uh, Baba and Terry Funk, those are the ones that I really enjoy. Okay. So Stan, I'm going to throw it to Barry now because I know that Barry has waited for this moment for a while because you see Barry is perhaps on all the podcasts in all the world, the world's biggest Jumbo Saruta fan. And I know Barry has got some Jumbo Saruta questions for you. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I knew this was coming too. So what Jeff just said was accurate. So I only, you know, sadly, I only saw Jumbo wrestle live uh, twice. Uh, but that being said, it, through the magic of YouTube and tape trading uh, some 20 years ago, I, I have seen what I would assume, you know, as far as recorded matches, the majority of Jumbo's career uh, through the magic of video and, and, and things, you know, being uh, being on the Internet on YouTube. So Jumbo Sharuda, because I'm such a huge fan and some of the matches that you had with Jumbo to me are some of the greatest matches in the history of professional wrestling. And I'm an old, I'm an old guy. I, I've been watching since 1971. Uh, you know, so how would you yeah. give me your favorite memories of Jumbo? Well, you know, Jumbo was a, uh, uh, he was the Japanese Olympic champion in Greco Roman as a heavyweight and went to the 72 Olympics. And then, uh, so that he ended up getting into professional wrestling in 1973 through, uh, through Giant Baba. And uh, they, uh, Baba sent him to Amarillo at the exact same time that I was getting broke in. So Jumbo and I were ended up working, you know, working out together, going to the gym together. Riding up and down the road a little bit. And there's and Stan, the there's actually, excuse me, there's actually a photo that's that's been out there on the Twitter and Facebook of you and Jumbo and, and around 1973 when you both broke in at approximately the same time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he they sent him to Amarillo to to, to train with the Funks because the Funks were actually booking for uh, for John Baba. And so, anyway, yeah, we were there at, at, at the same time. And uh, you mentioned uh, Scott Casey was also there about that time and was getting, uh, I think he was probably broke in a little bit earlier. But uh, but anyway, yeah, Jumbo, what a great talent. Uh, just, uh, you know, deceptionally strong. He could out, he could out uh, bench, bench, he could bench more. Not so much in weight, maybe, but he could do it longer. You know, he could do reps. He was a really strong guy and a great athlete. So um, one of the things I was thinking about your career in Japan, you know, you and Brody, your run as a tag team, although it was just legendary and you guys were such a true force, it really wasn't a long run. And when I was looking back at your career, I realized just how many different guys, you know, Ted DiBiase, Terry Gordy, Janichiro Tenru, you had a lot of different part dance, Spivey, a lot of different partners. So other than Brody, who do you remember as being your favorite tag team partner that you really thought you guys clicked? Yeah, I don't, you know, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I have to, I have to say Brody, you know, I mean, I, I want to say, because it's the truth. I mean, we, we were in a unique position there for about three or four years. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, I mean, we we ran we ran roughshod over Japan, and Japan didn't like it. And they, I mean, there was literally a fight going on in the ring, you know, between the Japanese talent because they they didn't want to lay down. Jumbo wasn't going to lay down, and, and of course, Baba was at the end of his deal. But you know, he was he was the boss, but uh, he wanted he wanted us to do our style and. And that's we we ended up doing that and really establishing. And then 
the Funks were there and they weren't going to take a second hand to uh, Brody and Hanson guys that were younger than them and also went to the same school. So, you know, it was, uh, it, it was really a competitive deal, but, uh, you well, know, you know Brody, one, one of the things, one of the things, Stan is, you know, as J all Japan evolved from the eighties into the nineties. And of course you were still there as a headliner and guys like Masawa, Kawada, Kobashi, Tawe, when, when they started uh, becoming the main eventers, uh, they, they came up with a style that came to be called King's Road style. Can you see the genesis of the King Ro King's Road style and the stuff that you and Brody and the Funks and Saruta were doing in the eighties? Well, I don't know. You know, I, I, I guess so. You know, all those guys, uh, you know, Bob had kept me in a, in a good position after Brody had left and everything. And, uh, you know, they went through Yatsu and some Japanese on Japanese stuff. And then, you know, Mazawa ended up leaving and taking a bunch of uh, the guys to form a new company. And so Baba, uh, he, all he had was Mazawa, Kawada and, uh, you know, Kobashi and, uh, so I, he was there and he expected me and I, I was able to stay involved by taking on these guys, uh, younger guys, like the next generation of Japanese guys. And they, and I mean, I fought them tooth and nail, but when they got over me, the, you know, the people, and they all got over me eventually, but man, I made them work and work hard. And we had some great, great matches. And but when they finally got over me, the people believed in them, and they were established as top guys. Sure, it, make, it makes the fans appreciate the the effort that the guys put into it, and finally, uh, you know, getting over you. Right, right. I, I guess so. You know, but uh, yeah, Bob, Baba was smart. You know, he was a smart guy. He, you know, he didn't say a whole lot, but he, uh, you know, he was a smart guy, and he knew knew what how what made things click in japan gotcha so uh our our producer sweet lou kippelman checking in here uh he has a question he says in in your book stan you say that you're a big baseball fan at heart today obviously being opening day uh but that you decided to pursue a football over baseball career because of the pure physicality of it so lou wants to know do you have a favorite team and do you have a world series prediction <laughs> well, my dad was from Brooklyn, and uh, during World War II, he moved out to Texas and met my my mom. So I was always a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And then when they moved to LA, I mean, I stayed with the Dodgers. So I'd have to say that the Dodgers, over time, is my favorite favorite team. And uh, you know, so I was actually watching them a little while ago uh, about. Uh, uh, you know, their opening day game, you know, they were bouncing around to four or five different games, but uh, that's what I was watching. But, you know, I chose football because I was probably better at football than I was baseball. So, you know, I, I, I like, I like football and I, I was, I was, a I was a good football player for, you know, back then when you were, I mean, a senior, I was like uh, 195. But, uh, you know, that's that's the way it was. So, you know, but so, I got a little bit bigger in college. And then, you know, after I got out of college, I got up a little higher, you know. And you had, you, you, had, you spent some time uh, with the Baltimore Colts in their camp, didn't you? I did. I went up there as a free agent to Baltimore the year after they, they uh, won the Super Bowl. And again, I mean, I, I wrote this in the book, but uh, – you know, I mean, I got to snap the ball to Johnny United, who was my all-time, I mean, he was my favorite player ever, you know, and when I was growing up, you know, and uh, here I was in camp with the guy, and, uh, you know, just uh, what an honor that was. To yeah, no pressure on that snap, huh? <laughs> yeah, and I snapped it early a couple of times, too, and he didn't like it. <laughs> so Barry you got another question 
Yeah, absolutely, too. So we were talking about Giant Bob, and we had uh, Danny Spivey. Uh, we, we actually had a chance to speak with Danny a couple of days ago, and Danny pretty much said Giant Bob, handshake, what, what everybody, there's a consistency where everybody basically says that. But what about your experiences in the States? Uh, you know, take out, say, Ole or Jim Barnett, but I know that you spent time in Memphis, and you obviously were a former AWA World Heavyweight Champion. How is it dealing with somebody like Vern Gon? after dealing with Giant Baba for so many years? Well, uh, they're two different people, obviously, you know. But, uh, you know, I don't, I, you know, that, Vern and I uh, butted heads almost from day one, but I don't have anything negative. I don't I don't talk negative about anybody that's passed away. You know, he, he, he was the... The head guy of the AWA, and uh, rightfully so, uh, you know, I mean, that was his territory and so forth. Uh, you know, I, I never, ever thought about ever, ever getting a, uh, the heavyweight belt. But they gave it to me. But then I, I felt like they never really promoted me. They, you know, it was just like squash job here, squash job there. You know, give me Kurt, Kurt Henning, you know. I mean, what a great young baby face. I could go out and or that Scott Hall before, you know, he, he, he became really big, you know, he was starting it and they were, you know, so they were all looking for somebody to try to uh, replace Hulk Hogan, you know, but anyway, so I did butt heads against, uh, you know, with Vern over, you know, the direction of it. And I still had Japan and, and I knew that Japan was my cup of tea and, uh, you know, I wasn't going to sacrifice anything. So, uh, it didn't work out between Vern and I, but, you know, we sat at the table together, you know, a, a number of years later at the cauliflower alley club. And, you know, we let our, all the water run underneath, you know, the bridge and it's no big deal. So anyway, you know, well, let me ask you, since you were talking about, uh, you know, how you'd wanted to work with uh, Kurt or Scott, you uh, when you went to uh, WCW in uh, 1989, you had a chance to work with Lex Luger. What are your memories of working with Lex uh, during that run? Well, I heard I heard nothing but kind of negative things. Uh, you know, he's a big muscle head and he's got a big ego and everything. But you know, I had no problems whatsoever, man. We, uh, you know, we got on. We I thought we had some really good matches. Uh, I think him and Brody as a real famous run in somewhere down in Orlando or, or something, but and Fort uh, Lauderdale, know, as a matter of fact, right where I'm from. Well, okay. I, I, I anyway, it does, so wherever that was, but you know, that was between him and Brody and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, he, he was nothing but all ears and, uh, respectful to me. And I have nothing negative to say about it, you know? Barry, I think you got one last question for Stan. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, we don't want to take up too much of Stan's time, so I, I, I'm tossing now between. But I, I'm going to go with a food question, Stan. So you're a guy <laughs> that has traveled the world. Dude, so, obviously, yeah. I love food. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Jeff is the Jeff is fleshy. That's, That's his nickname. Jim Cornette has nicknamed Jeff Fleshy. Uh, but no, it's, it, you know, it, you have traveled the world. You spent so much time in Japan, but you wrote about Japanese cuisine in your book. And I remembered that because it resonated with me. So if I said to you, Stan Hansen, uh, I, I have a jumbo jet. I have an unlimited bank account, neither of which are even remotely true in any form. But if they were, Stan, I'm taking you out. We're going to go out and get something to eat. What is the one restaurant in the entire world that you would want to go to? In the in the entire world? Yep, in the entire world. And, uh, uh, it's uh, Yumi's Restaurant. And is that in Japan? No, it's at my house. My wife's name <laughs> is Yumi. And, what a uh, smart answer. What a good answer, Stan. Genius answer, <laughs> absolutely. She's the best cook of all time. <laughs> she can cook it all. You know, so, she can cook uh, fried chicken. She can cook chicken fried steak. She can cook, you know, all the Japanese dishes, anything, man. She, she's a great cook, and uh, she learned, uh, of course, she can uh, do all that kinds of uh, Japanese dishes so and we eat we eat a lot of fish and we eat a lot of Japanese dishes uh I mean 
probably three quarters of them during the week are kind of Japanese stuff style dishes. So uh, that's good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was the main thing that got me to stay in Japan was because I learned, I learned to go out and enjoy the Japanese cuisine and everything. Instead of chasing down a McDonald's or a Kentucky fried chicken, I got away from all that and went strictly Japanese. And I, once I learned to love the food, then uh, staying in Japan for 25 years was easy. Sure. Well, Stan, I just got a couple last questions to uh, before we wrap up here. One of the questions we always ask our guests that have been in the business, and I ask you this at the dinner uh, conversation we had, and I want to see if you come up with the same answer. So, Stan, you're in a restaurant, whether it's United States or uh, over in Japan, and you got uh, 10 guys that have the, uh, let's just say, the beer courage, and they're looking over and they're seeing you. Uh, you know, you're one of those wrestlers who think they're tough guys, and they're going to come over and try to cause some problems with you. So tell me two guys that you want standing on either side of you to help you deal with this situation. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, what answer would I uh, have I get? There's a bunch of guys I'd like to stand by. Well, Bruiser Brody would be one of them. And, okay. Uh, Terry Funk just about the toughest SOB in the whole whole country. You know, I beat him so much, and he was he never gave in. You know, he was he was tough. Uh, you know, I, and Steve Williams, he was a good guy. I mean, I mean, there are so many guys that I was around that were uh, really horses. So. Well, I'll just uh, I'll just remind you, Stan. At the dinner, we were playing a little joke on this uh, this guy that I used to know, and we told uh, told you that he was a big fan of Terry Gordy's. So what you said was, "Oh, Terry oh. would be there, but he'd be running out the back door." <laughs> and you, you did it as a rib on the on the guy because he was such a Gordy fan. Yeah, yeah well, I don't uh, I you know I don't remember that, but te uh, <laughs> Terry Gordy was uh, somebody that uh, would. You know, he he had been in a few altercations in his day. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a great talent he was too. Yeah, oh, yeah, one of the best. I mean, they were grooming him. You know, I mean, he he was destined to take over. You know, for all Japan and everything, and uh, you know, it's it, it's a sad deal. You know, but he was he was he was one of the the best talent. You know, three hundred pound guy. You know, like. Brody and I, a few guys are that size, you know. Back then, that was kind of big, but it's not so big anymore. Sure. But okay. Anyway. So before I before I ask my last question of you, we once again, Barry, why don't you uh, plug Stan's appearance coming up here right before WrestleMania, and then I'll yeah. ask one last question. Absolutely, too. So you can meet Stan Hansen. You can shake his hand. You can get an autograph. You can take a photo. It is Mark out at the Meadowlands coming up on April the 7th, 2019, which is WrestleMania Sunday, taking place in beautiful downtown Secaucus, New Jersey. It is a West, West Texas uh, reunion. Stan Hansen, Tully Blanchard, Merced Solis, Tito Santana, Scott Casey, also in attendance, Billy Jack Keynes, Danny Spivey, Hacksaw Butch Reed, Shane Douglas, and good old JR, Jim Ross, plus a host of, I think there's 30 more talents there. This is going to be a huge event. Stan, I am going to come up, introduce myself, and uh, I may even bring some, uh, some, a pack of chaw with me uh, to hand to you that day. But I'm real excited about this. Uh, and Jeff, you said you had one more question for Stan? Yeah, and, and of course, I also do want to remind the folks that uh, Scott Teal's Crowbar Press does still have uh, Stan's book, The Last Outlaw, which is a terrific wrestling book and i highly recommend it so here's what i'm gonna leave you with stan same question i left you with at the dinner table that night in fort lauderdale a couple years ago of course you're really famously linked with your friend frank goodish and there have been so many uh questions and stories about frank that have been asked so i'd like you as we end uh, our little uh, interview here with you tell the folks about your friend frank outside the ring and what you remember about him outside the ring not Bruiser Brody, your friend Frank Goodish. What do you remember? Well, I mean, uh, I, I got to I got to see Frank uh, down in San Antonio at his home uh, with his wife Barbara and uh, his young son uh, Jeff, and uh, so it, you know that's that's the the Brody that he had a lot of ideas and things that evidently that he was planning to do to 
help out kids and, and do a lot of things to uh, give back in, in that San Antonio area. And uh, of course, it, uh, his life was, uh, you know, cut short and, and it never happened. But, you know, to me, that's, that's the, the possibility of what he was hoping to do in, uh, in that situation and going forward. Uh, I think that, that, that really tells the, the real Brody, you know, a lot of the guys, you know, Stan Hansen, you know, when I take off my glasses, and the bell rings, you know, then, you know, I do become Stan Hansen, the wrestler, but you know, the rest of the time I'm, you know, uh, you can't be that character all the time when you're walking around and Brody couldn't be bruiser Brody all the time either. So, you know, uh, yeah, so I, I'd, I, I'd, I'd love to see Frank today. You know, he often said, he said, I started in the opening match. I'm going to keep wrestling until I'm in the first match of the card again. <laughs> so <I don't, laughs> well, listen, Stan, that that's great. great stuff. I, I do want to say that Barry, on behalf of Barry and myself, we certainly do appreciate your time. We hope that uh, the folks will come out to the mark out at the Meadowlands. And uh, as yeah, Barry I has. Hope, I hope everybody comes out. We didn't get to talk about West Texas a lot, but. Marcel Solis, you know, Tito Santana, he he was uh, he was the guy that I, I mean, I coached him as a freshman kid at West Texas and, you know, went on to become just a huge star, great star, great guy. And, uh, you know, Tully Blanchard and, I mean, you know, Kelly Kanitsky. I mean, you can name off. I mean, there's so many guys, you know, and Dick Murdoch, even though he didn't go to West Texas, we have to say that he's an honorary. <laughs> and you're, yeah, you're forgetting so, uh, Ted DiBiase. Yeah, Ted DiBiase, of course, and, uh, sure. you know, uh, like you said, Tully and Manny Fernandez is another guy, you know, and uh, Bobby Duncan, you know, big Bobby Duncan, yeah. you know. I mean, what a That's great smart, talent yeah. he was, and he influenced me a lot in uh, a great style, too. So, you know, I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about West Texas a little more. I was I was hoping to, but anyway, oh, we, we, uh, we, I enjoyed we it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So, once again, Stan, thanks so much for your time. We do appreciate it, and uh, we'll be talking to you down the road. Okay, thanks. See you in uh, New York.